my background is actually originally in public health, so this topic is extremely important to my heart. Um, and uh, housing is, as many of us know, one of Maslow's basic needs. It is also a component of social determinants of health. And as Matthew Desmond, the author of Evicted, the 2017 17 Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction wrote, housing is absolutely essential to human flourishing. Without stable shelter, it all falls apart. So I'm extremely pleased that this is one of the topics that the League has chosen for this year. And with that, I will pass it on to Vijaya, who is the current president of the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we really appreciate the uh, Public Library being our co-sponsor and offering this venue to us. Um, and also doing all of the arrangements. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, this is the League of Women Voters' uh, first monthly community forum of our fiscal year. And uh, this is a very important topic on creative solutions to our community housing crisis, as is evidenced by so many experts uh, at the panelist table. Uh, I'm Vijaya Jamalamarika. I'm the new president of our local league. Our membership director, Susan Horn, is at the table near the entrance. She's new too, so please support us uh, by becoming members. We do a lot of good work, and um, we also uh, would like a lot of help. So please, if you have a bit of time, this is a great opportunity to learn new skills. Um, thank you to Gary Atkins, Sound Systems, and to Olivia Uribe of Transil Pro doing simultaneous translations uh, for us. And thank you to our TV Santa Barbara crew and Erica Schweitzer, who is new also, <laughs> in charge of this production. And we will also be live streaming this event to Facebook. So both English and Spanish translations of uh, versions of this video will be available on our league's website, uh, linking to our YouTube site. So um, you can go onto our website and get this video in a few days. Um, also check TVSB's website for their schedule to see when this video will be aired on channel 17 and 71. Um, I have a few announcements. We have discussion groups uh, following this forum, uh, you can, if you're a member, you can come to, and even if you're not, and if you'd like to be a member, uh, come to a, a two discussion groups. One is coming up on September 27th. It's a lunch group meeting at Dargan's, and Emily will be there to answer any uh, one. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be doing this one-on-one -on -one focus on these creative solutions following this forum. And then um, we also have a supper discussion group at Madame Lou's, and that's on October 1st, 5.30. Uh, RSVPs are needed, and so if you want to come, uh, email me or let me know. I'll be right here. Um, we're sorry this Carpenteria discussion group has been canceled. Our next month's forum is on October 16th, and we will be back to our regular time from noon to, to 2 p.m. And the topic is kids, cages, and immigration crisis in Santa Barbara. So very timely. That promises to be a very interesting forum again. All of our forums are interesting. Um, and then on September 29th, um, our long-term partner, uh, 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 Coalition Against Gun Violence is holding a fundraiser at the Santa Barbara Club at 2.30 p.m. There will be three doctors speaking on treating gunshot wounds, and the invitations uh, are available or on their website. Um, so please read our email updates and check our website calendar for the latest events. Uh, we keep changing uh, the calendar. And so, um, and lastly, thank you to our league team for working on the logistics of this forum. Susan Horn, uh, Pam Flint Tambo, and Barney Jensen with the water. Uh, thank you to Emily Allen for organizing and moderating this forum. Emily Allen is the co-chair of the league's 
Social Policy Committee. So if you're interested in social policy issues, please join this committee. We deal with many issues, including criminal justice reform, uh, a, a number of other issues. Um, and uh, so she's our Social Policy Committee Chair, Co-Chair, and Director of Impact Initiatives for United Way Home for Good, Santa Barbara County. Please welcome our moderator, Emily Allen. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. Um, as you heard, I'm Emily Allen with the United Way and Home for Good and also the League of Women Voters. And one thing I'll mention about the League of Women Voters is just last year we updated our policy on homelessness and did some really good work in bringing that um, up to date. Now we're in the process at the Social Policy Committee of also looking at some of our housing policies and updating those. At the state level, the League of Women Voters voted to, for the next two years, focus on housing and homelessness. So it's an issue of concern to the League, as well as many of the people in our community. So we're here tonight because we know that we are in the middle of an affordable housing and homeless crisis. For every 100 extremely low-income households in need of an affordable apartment, only 29 units are available. So that means people who need affordable housing are not, access, not able to access it, which means more people are experiencing homelessness. So it's time we really feel for government leaders, the private sector, and nonprofits to get creative and serious about solutions. So, well, I'll click. So we, we know that we can look at and use what we call evidence-based standards. We can look at what has been proven to work in other communities. We can work with policymakers and community advocates to ensure that housing and homeless needs are being addressed. We can implement what is called a coordinated entry system, which we have in Santa Barbara County, and I talked about it at our last homeless forum, but it's a system that helps us make sure that individuals and families are um, efficiently matched to the housing and resources that meet their specific needs. We can also empower what we call a funders collaborative that can make sure that philanthropy and public funders are coming together around proven solutions that are meeting our housing and service needs. The coordinated entry system that I mentioned has now, with many partner agencies, over 22 countywide partner agencies, has now surveyed over 2,000 people in Santa Barbara County. So that started January 23rd, 2018. And from this data and information, we now know how many people need permanent supportive housing, so 739 people who need housing, a subsidy, and supportive services, and how many people need what we call rapid rehousing, 702. Rapid rehousing, it's, um, again, supportive services and rental assistance, but for a more time-limited period. These interventions that I just mentioned, permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, They've been studied, they're what we call evidence-based solutions, but we also wanna be creative and really look at what are other ways that we can create more units of housing and the supportive services that we know that we need so that people, once they move into housing, stay housed. So some of the solutions we're looking at today are things like home share and cooperative housing, small and tiny houses, social impact investment and other ways of incentivizing um, private investors to help address these issues, reducing building costs so that we can build housing more cost effectively, supportive housing and housing first, which really touches on the supportive service side, zoning and regulation changes, rent stabilization measures, right to counsel, and revenue measures, so bonds and sales taxes in ways that local communities can raise local dollars to really effectively draw down those federal and state dollars into our community. So this is a lot, and we've got a large panel, as you can see. So we're gonna have a timekeeper that's gonna help us um, kind of stick to 
a fast pace so that we have time to address a few different questions. And those questions are first, we're gonna have the different panelists introduce themselves and their agency and talk a bit about what they're doing right now to, that is creative in Santa Barbara County. And I think that's important because we are doing creative things here in our community. Some of those things we want to do at a larger scale, and we want to um, you know, really scale up and do more of. And then we're going to ask the question, what creative housing solutions would you like to see that would have the greatest impact? And we're going to do some polling in between and get the audience to participate and give us your feedback. Um, so we will, we will get started. Um, our first speaker today, Kimberly Albers, is the Homeless Assistance Program Manager with the County of Santa Barbara, and she's with the Housing and Community Development Division. Yes, I'm Kimberly Albers. I'm the Homeless Assistance Program Manager, which means that I sit in the Housing and Community Development Division, but a lot of the funding that you've been hearing about and a lot of historical funding that addresses homelessness flows um, through our division. And so we are a funder of crea creative housing solutions and then oftentimes a monitor as those projects go, go forward. So it really is an exciting time. Um, even though we are definitely in a crisis um, to be in housing and homelessness because we have new resources and new legislation um, that are making some of these creative housing solutions a reality. So I was going to highlight um, two projects that are actually similar, one that's taking place that we are funding in North County and one in South County with what you may remember from last fall, the Homeless Emergency Aid Program funding. And so both are currently in the development process. They're not actually under construction yet, but we're getting closer. So both are taking large lots with existing homes and maximizing the housing capacity of those lots by developing and adding permanent supportive housing um, to that lot. So the first project in North County is adding two small homes for formerly homeless families. A small meaning of under 500 square foot, yet both have two bedrooms, two baths, a living area, and kind of like you can picture kind of a studio style living area um, with a kitchen. The other second project adds a larger home to the middle of a large lot um, where shared housing will be provided to formerly homeless individuals. And both projects are being undergone by longtime trusted providers here in the community. Both are single level. Um, projects. The homes will be factory built, um, but will be erected on permanent pads with added trim, siding, pitched roofs um, that will really fit into the existing neighborhoods. And even though in both cases they're likely not to be very visible at all from the street because of how they're, um, they're situated. But combining factory built with permanent foundations allows neighbors not to have to go through a lengthy build out time period, which is another plus. It's more energy efficient when we have these smaller square footage um, per person. And it takes advantage of, if you remember, it was time limited one time funding that we invested in capital to develop these permanent housing solutions. So they'll be at use um, to, for the community uh, for many, many years to come, even with one-time funding. So these are both modest projects, but that will really impact lives and truly something that could be replicated um, on other larger lots that already have residential properties. So next we have Noah Campo, uh, Member Service Coordinator at the Santa Barbara Student Housing Cooperative. And I know just from conversations with people, people want to know more about cooperatives. <clears throat> yeah, I'm the co-op guy. Um, so yeah, my name is Noah Campo. I'm the Director of Member Services at the Santa Barbara Student Housing Cooperative. Um, I'm also now on the board of Future Housing Communities, which Linda is going to talk more about. Um, SBSHC, uh, we are a group equity student housing cooperative. And if you don't know what that means, it means that our housing is collectively owned and operated by the people that live there. And in our case, it is mostly university students. Um, we're a nonprofit. 
So there's no landlord making a profit off the fact that these students need housing. Um, we operate six properties total. There's five of them in Isla Vista and one now in the West Side neighborhood in Santa Barbara. And we give housing to 107 members total. Um, we're an affordable housing provider. And for comparison, um, I just looked up the, the 2020 uh, fair market rents in Santa Barbara County. Um, an efficiency apartment in Santa Bar Barbara County, uh, fair market rent is over $1,500 and a one-bedroom apartment is over $1,700. Uh, by contrast, our 107 members, uh, they pay around, they pay 700, an average of $704 a month. Um, so this, for students, this is thousands of dollars less in student loans that they have to take out, and this is hours that they don't have to spend working to pay their rent that they can focus on being students. Um, SBSHC is also more than just affordable housing. All our co-op members take part in running every aspect of our organization, from cooking community meals, serving on our board of directors and writing our annual budget. They're learning really valuable life skills in business, uh, property maintenance, gardening, event planning, and, and a lot more. Um, our members are also practicing cooperative skills, such as collective decision-making, uh, practicing everyday democracy, running their homes together, and learning conflict resolution. Um, in a time when it often seems like we're uh, extremely divided, we are giving students a chance to practice making decisions with people from a variety of backgrounds uh, and making up solutions together. SBSHC also provides housing to historically and currently marginalized groups of our community. We provide supportive housing to low-income folks, members of the LGBTQ community, and people of color. We also have specialized housing for people practicing veganism and people interested in interfaith and social justice programming. Um, we are a values-based housing provider, um, not only providing housing, but a platform for personal and community empowerment. Um, people who live in co-ops regularly say that it's a transformative experience. They're more likely to be civically engaged, to get involved in local politics, um, and carry those skills with them in, for the rest of their life. Um, and so, yeah, I'm here really excited to see what everyone has to say and see if there's a way that we can expand this model beyond just students, um, but to everyone looking for housing in Santa Barbara County. Thank you. Great. Next, we have Rob Fredericks, Executive Director and CEO of our Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara. I'll just say they do a lot of creative things, and we have a handout here on the back table that features at least one of their creative housing developments. Thanks, Emily. Good evening, everyone. So uh, as Emily said, we're, I'm with the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara, and we are the affordable housing operating arm of the city. Uh, we've been around since 1969. In fact, next month, October, is our 50th anniversary birthday. So uh, we've been doing a lot of great work uh, for the community. We've provided over, we've built uh, over 1,368 units within the city of Santa Barbara, affordable housing developments across 68 properties, serving families, seniors, those with disabilities and people moving from homelessness. So uh, we're really proud of uh, the different diversity of, of clients that we serve and that we lean into the issue of meeting the challenge of providing affordable housing in Santa Barbara. A couple of uh, developments that we're currently working on that you might have seen dri driving around town, uh, the Gardens on Hope at 251 South Hope Avenue right next to Bunin Chevrolet. It is 90 senior units, will be 90 senior units uh, there, and it's modeled after our very successful garden court development on De La Vina, where um, we'll be serving frail seniors who can no longer live uh, as full life independently, but uh, in order to keep, the, keep people from having to move uh, too early to board and cares or other type of uh, facilities, we will be providing three meals a day, uh, housekeeping services, and a host of social services to, to really uh, provide that whole person care for, for seniors living there. And so we're really excited about that development, which should open uh, mid-February of next year. 
it's moving along quite nicely. Our other development that we're, uh, we're currently uh, under construction is Johnson Court over by the high school at uh, 813 East Carrillo Street. Uh, it's between Nopal and uh, Milpas. And uh, that's 17 studio units and it'll be serving uh, veterans, veterans moving from uh, homelessness. So there's a great need there for that uh, uh, throughout the country and in, in our own community. So we're excited about uh, meeting that challenge as well. Uh, next, we just purchased a property. You may have read about it, 200 North La Cumbra. It's a current office medical complex. It's uh, 1.34 acres. So it's enough land for us to be able to do something really good for the community. We haven't figured out who we're going to serve there yet, uh, the program that will be there. We have, uh, it's out for RFP with, our, with planners and architects currently, but you know, there's, there's a huge need across the board still for whether you're serving, uh, you have a need for, for uh, adults living with uh, developmental disabilities or senior, still great need for senior housing, f uh, workforce housing, family uh, housing, uh, the missing middle that people talk about. There's a great need there. So um, that's another project we're really excited about. Future projects, um, difficult for us uh, to, to look at down the future because uh, Santa Barbara is really a built-out community uh, and we need to we need to do more though the need is growing uh, and I was just at the APA American Planning Association conference uh, for the state that was held here this week and if you if any of you attended the need is really really growing so we have to lead in, lean into the issue we're not going to be able to solve everything but uh, uh, so maybe we need to look at the other end of things, uh, providing people a living wage so they have earn enough income to afford housing, right? I want to invoke, before I, before I end, I want to invoke Matthew Desmond's name again, another quote from Matthew Desmond. His quote is, a living wage is an antidepressant. It is a sleep aid, a diet, a stress reliever. It is a contraceptive preventing teenage pregnancy. It prevents premature deaths. It shields children from neglect. So we need to think about that end of the spectrum as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Linda Honickman, um, coalition builder with Future Housing Communities, and she's going to tell us a bit about home sharing and some of the work that they're doing. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Linda Honickman, co-founder of a new organization called Future Housing Communities. We started with a core group about a year ago, and we were just um, sharing ideas related to our local housing crisis. We're a diverse group of different ages, ethnicities, incomes, and we've begun work on a number of projects, including the exploration of different community model components, like cooperatives, communal, sorry, community land trusts, lease to own, and a sustainable Echo Village. We also recently launched a new home share program, NeighborMatch.org, thanks to the direction of my fellow FHC board member, Matt Lowe. NeighborMatch seeks to match folks with space to compatible folks who need space. I've learned that the majority of South County residents do not have housing stability. I've become aware of how much owning a home helped my family recover from financial setbacks. And I was surprised to learn that the city of Santa Barbara is more than 60% renters. I knew the crisis was widespread when a number of friends had to move out of their rented homes and had no place to go because of the skyrocketing rents and zero vacancy rate. In those cases, there was an increase in stress and a decrease in health. FHC is not going to focus on serving the homeless or folks who are typically helped by our housing authorities because that's well taken care of with many of the people at this table. But sadly, there are thousands of other residents that can have their life turned upside down with the discovery of mold or the death of a landlord. So we will do what we can to find and promote the building of more units. The focus for future housing communities this year has been collecting information 
and speaking to decision makers and stakeholders who help define problems and identify partners. Two members of our core group, Matt, the young neighbor match founder who is vision impaired and out of town, otherwise he would be speaking, and J.P. Harada, who I'm grateful to, who's here tonight, who grew up in Old Town Galita and wants to help low-income families earn equity. They have provided a very important perspective from their constituencies. We heard stories that confirmed data that the 25 to 44 age group and Latinx families have been leaving the area because of high rents, while the 65 plus age group continues to grow. We will need to make very intentional changes to our assumptions and housing policies if we want a vibrant, diverse, and economically healthy community. The community part of our name is important. It is not just physical spaces that are needed for shelter. We also need more supportive neighborhoods. We can all appreciate the importance of coming together in a natural disaster. So we could start by adding a phone tree to our existing neighborhoods. Or new buildings can be designed to accommodate more affordable shared facilities with the help of folks who have formed a compatible community ahead of time. The ultimate goal of future housing communities is to assist in the development of new affordable and sustainable community models which can provide stability for all. Important first steps through next year will be to provide community education about our crisis and ideas for solutions. And we will advocate for, re for residents and workers who do not have housing stability and can't easily speak for themselves. Some are busy working or looking after their family, or others have already left town. If you are interested in being a neighborhood journalist to collect housing stories, an advocate for a particular constituency, or would like to volunteer with us, please look at the flyers at the back and sign our sheet. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Alex Lambros, the Director of Litigation at the Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County. Hi, um, good evening everybody. Nice to see such a big turnout. It's uh, very encouraging. Um, that maybe speaks more than we could speak that so many people came out and are concerned about the issue. Anyhow, at Legal Aid, I think all our current programs are creative because we feature free lawyers. Um, and that's, you know, I and others that work there, we're just living and proud to be oxymorons in that, in that, um, that respect. Um, I can't even keep up with what lawyers charge. Uh, just don't even know. It's, it's stratospheric. So we have, um, what are our free lawyers offer in terms of housing? We have programs in, in uh, across the county, uh, Santa Barbara, Lompoc, Santa Maria. We have programs in the courthouses called legal resource centers um, in each of the three courthouses in the county. And we have multiple outreach programs where we have volunteer lawyers helping, usually one day a week in the afternoon. Um, let's say the West Side Community Center, the East Side Community Center, and uh, Goleta Community Center. What we're currently working on that's different than usual than just doing tenant rights and defending tenants in landlord-tenant um, disputes and trying to usually dispute, diffuse those dis disputes before they get out of hand or get into court if we can, is the latest ordinance um, by the city of Santa Barbara, which um, um, came as a surprise, but a, a welcome surprise. It's called um, uh, five, Ordinance 5885. I encourage you to look at it. It's not all that long. It's uh, relatively easy to understand. I, I read it and, and don't say to myself or to somebody, I, I need a lawyer to understand this. So that's encouraging. <laughs> um, and what the, is that ordinance? It is the... I'm going to explain it. Oh, go ahead. So, yeah. the, 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 key, the key features... Uh, I used to work with Emily, so she doesn't mind um, helping. 
Um, it, the key features are the landlords need to offer one-year leases to the tenants. Um, that increases, I believe, um, housing stability because, let's say, just use one, one hypothetical, um, a landlord can't at, at her whim give you a 30 or 60 day notice if you have a one year lease. <coughs> the other interesting, uh, I think, helpful feature is what they call um, the, the requirement for conciliation meetings if the landlord wants to end the tenancy, and that is the equivalent of a mediation. So, and if those things aren't fulfilled by the uh, landlord, the tenant can use um, the landlord's failure to um, give notice of those things, of those options, and as a defense to their unlawful detainer. So that's pretty exciting um, new area that we're um, dealing with, and the, the judges aren't really up on that yet because it's so new. The other uh, thing quickly that we're dealing with is the post uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura um, County disasters. We only deal with Ventura, uh, Santa Barbara County. Um, the, the governor put a moratorium on rent increases above 10% for a year, and I think this is the second year that that's been in effect. It's going to expire at the end of this year, but we've used that as a defense where uh, landlords were raising the rents too much um, uh, because the housing crisis has gotten even more of a, more uh, crucial, uh, given the uh, the fires and and the the uh, flood flood disasters we've had. So um, there's a there's a cutoff there of 10 percent. We've and we've been enforcing that tenant right as well. So those are two new things that that are um, I would say present creative programs or projects within our program. Great, thank you. Next, we have Tessa Madden Storms, the Senior Director of Development and Communications at PATH, and here for PATH Santa Barbara. <laughs> Hi, uh, as Emily mentioned, my name is Tessa Madden Storms. Um, so I, I wear a couple hats, and so I, ha I actually have two titles. So I'm the Senior Director of Development and Communications for PATH Statewide, and I also uh, serve as the Regional Director here locally in Santa Barbara. So for those of you who aren't familiar, PATH is actually a statewide um, homeless service agency committed to truly ending homelessness um, for individuals, families, and communities. And we do this by um, working with our homeless neighbors to move them off the streets, out of the shelter system, and into their own permanent homes. Locally here in Santa Barbara, our programming is focused around a facility that you guys, many of you might be familiar with, um, what was once Casa Esperanza um, at Cacique and Milpas. Um, PATH merged with Casa Esperanza in July of 2015, um, and we partner with the city and the county and Cottage Health to provide 100 beds of transitional housing at that facility um, for people experiencing homelessness that, that includes a wide range of supportive services, um, including everything from case management to health care, employment, housing location, and all of those programs are focused on helping our neighbors make it permanently home. Um, in the last four years since PATH merged with Casa Esperanza, we've been able to do that for about 400 of our homeless neighbors who were once living on the streets. Um, most recently, and in, in where the, it kind of fits into th this discussion this evening, thanks to the HEAP funding that Kimberly mentioned earlier, we've actually been able to add a really exciting program to our portfolio that's really centered around um, landlord engagement and coordinating housing location countywide. Um, this initiative is called Lease Up. Some of you, I think, were probably involved in our kickoff that happened a couple months ago, and um, our team that supports that program is here tonight for questions after. Um, but it's really designed to not only educate our landlords around um, leasing, what it looks like to lease to someone who's transitioning out of homelessness and encouraging them to lease and, and breaking some of those stigmas around that, but also employs a tech component um, where we've actually in-house at PATH designed a platform that, that looks and feels and works like a Zillow um, for units specifically available to people transitioning off the streets, voucher holders, low-income folks, um, that, that providers across the county, this is a countywide initiative, that providers across the county can use to help their um, residents or clients find housing solutions for them. Um, 
And then additionally, we're really active in permanent supportive housing development as path across the state. Um, we have actually developed 750 units of permanent supportive housing um, in a variety of communities. Um, we have 13 different physical structures that house those 750 units. Um, and while we haven't gotten there yet here in Santa Barbara, it's something we're absolutely committed to doing and in conversations and exploring with a number of the folks at this table um, and in this room. Um, so it's something that we're committed to bringing here and working with you all as the community to provide. Um, so we're really just excited to be a partner in the housing solutions and in the creative housing solutions and looking forward to diving in, really focused on our homeless neighbors. I know we're representing uh, the wide range of things here, but really looking at our homeless neighbors and what we can do to increase housing stock to in engage um, landlords and folks who currently have housing, who are, are, are managing the current housing stock to break those stigmas. Um, to uh, engage and to ultimately help our um, neighbors experiencing homelessness make it home. Thank you. Next is Jennifer McGovern, the president and CEO of the Housing Trust Fund of Santa Barbara County. And maybe, I'm sure not everyone knows what a housing trust fund is, so <laughs> yeah. thank you. We're the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's a little bit of a joke. Um, we're a nonprofit community development financial institution certified by the U.S. Treasury, and we're basically, uh, our mission is to create partnerships to bring together more financial resources to help facilitate and expand affordable housing opportunities. That's our whole mission. So right now we work with nine different banks, one foundation, the U.S. Treasury and State HCD, and we've over the years put together about an $11 million fund that revolves and does a variety of things. We operate three main programs. So the first is a housing production program. We make low cost loans to sponsors of affordable housing uh, to help facilitate their projects. We're just one piece of the financing. All of these projects have many layers, but we like to think sometimes we're the glue that might make a little difference. Um, recently, we've done some special needs housing and group homes for homeless. So we're really, uh, we do a variety of things, but we're really pleased to be serving that population right now. The second thing we do is we provide down payment assistance for first time home buyers. And in South County, we have a new program that provides a down payment loan up to $100,000, interest only. It serves low to middle income residents, and um, we've done 10 loans so far, and I'm pleased to say 40% of our loans have served low and moderate income households, and 60% what we call upper, moderate, or middle income. So it's the whole range of the local workforce. The idea is to have people be able to get, uh, put down roots in the community, buy an entry level home, be able to live closer to where they work and participate. The third thing we've started, which is, I think, in the creative kind of exciting uh, area, is a housing innovations program. And this program is designed to address how can we shift the paradigm and cut the cost of developing housing. Uh, we're starting with the construction costs, and hopefully later on it can morph into things like local fees and the planning process. But we're looking at, can we reduce the time involved and the construction cost? And to do that, we've partnered with a group called Apis Core, which is a robotics engineering firm out of Boston. And I have some flyers at the back of the room. And this is a, I don't know if you can see it, their first prototype. And we are going to sponsor the first 3D printed affordable home in Santa Barbara County, perhaps California. And this is an exciting technology. Uh, they've demonstrated that you can 3D print uh, a, a small 407 square foot home in 24 hours at the cost of $10,000. Wow. We think this has a future. And that it could be an amazing thing for like accessory dwelling units. Imagine bringing the robot into your backyard and printing your house in 24, maybe two days. And won't the neighbors be happy instead of 
12 months of construction. <laughs> Um, so it has a lot of applicability for special needs housing, homeless housing. It's scalable. We can build small homes. We can build large group homes. And um, we're looking for a site. And um, we're very excited about doing this. We're going to try to engage the whole community. And also, it's fire resistant. And we're going to use sustainable energy systems. Thanks. That's exciting. Next, we have John Polanski, the Director of Housing Development at the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Barbara. And thank you very much, Emily, and thank you to everybody taking your time to attend this important forum. We are the other housing authority in <laughs> Santa Barbara County. You have two housing authorities within the entire county of Santa Barbara, the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara, and then we do the other seven cities and all of the unincorporated area. So that includes from the city of Carpinteria up to Guadalupe and Santa Maria, and then the unincorporated areas such as Isla Vista and the Santa Inez Valley. We have actually, and we work really closely with Rob and his talented team. And with only two housing authorities in Santa Barbara County, we have to work really closely together and we, when we advocate and as we're looking for new sources of funding. Uh, we were formed by the Board of Supervisors in 1941. So for those of you, I did this on my calculator, we celebrated our 78th uh, birthday in June. Uh, we have countywide uh, 1,324 units with 80 units under construction and eight projects in some type of development spread throughout South County and North County um, equally. Uh, a couple of different highlights that I'd like to present is our West Cox Cottages development, which is 30 units of housing up in the city of Santa Maria. Uh, we just got the tax credit committee staff report and we are going to be recommended for funding for low income housing tax credits at their meeting next Wednesday. I will be there to make sure that, that I can answer any of their questions that so we get it. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is we are going to be doing factory built housing for the first time at the Housing Authority. What I did not realize until Eddie from United Way and Joe from House of Builders let me know, there is a factory up in the city of Santa Maria that does really quality factory built housing. It's called API. And so we did a factory tour, we were really impressed. So we're working with architects, we're not taking something that's, that's just off the shelf. We are working with architects to design one bedroom unit so we'll meet the needs of the folks we're, we're likely to serve there. It's gonna be in a cottage, uh, duplex, fourplex style of the site plan. So veterans with PTSD, other people whose mental health challenges, if they don't do well in those more intense environments where you have three stories and you have about 60 other neighbors, we're, we're hoping this will serve that, uh, that population. And we're really excited to, about this, um, our first attempt at that. And we'll let you know how it goes. The great thing about it, in creative um, housing, we're also talking about funding. Instead of a little bit over 400,000 a unit, which is our 80 unit development under construction, known as the residences at Depot Street, which will serve Mental Health Services Act eligible individuals, this is a total cost of about 8.7 million, so under 300,000 a unit. Uh, to do this duplex, fourplex style, and that's all in. That includes land and, and the cost of entitlements. Really excited about that. We're also working with Good Samaritan Shelter on a couple of small houses. Yes, small houses are larger than tiny homes, <laughs> <laughs> but they're not as big as, as the regular. It's, it's right around 500 square feet, as, as Kimberly mentioned. Um, so what we're looking for as far as the other, and, and it, we were asked to do a wish list. Uh, redevelopment agencies, as you know, were dissolved a, a few years back. But we have a new governor, and he's looking to see if we can uh, reinvigorate some additional resources. We've talked about the HEAP funding, which was a great start. We've talked about No Place Like Home, or I don't think we have yet. That's the Mental Health Services Act uh, replacement. But please advocate federally for additional Section 8 uh, Housing Choice Voucher resources so we can provide rental assistance in our units and in the private marketplace, and also to support the low-income housing tax credit, the Home Investment Partnership, 
and the CDBG, and that's the end of my ad. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next, um, and I, I don't want to say your name incorrectly, so maybe I'll let you. <laughs> Didn't test it out before. Thank you. So, Mauri Ruano. Thank you. Para darle 20 segundos de de tiempo a ella para que descanse. Voy a hacer mi introducción en español para mis amigos y amigas de habla hispana. Uh, soy el subdirector de la compañía People Self Housing y les invito a que se involucren siempre a estos eventos. So my name is Mauri Ruano, as I said before, and I'm the deputy director of People Self Housing. And our office is right across the street, but we have offices in San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. So at this point, uh, let me read actually our mission. Uh, we build affordable homes with site-based services that offer opportunities to change lives and strengthen communities on the central coast of California. And, I, and as, like I said before, that would be San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County. And um, we were founded in 1970, which means that this is our 50th year of uh, providing housing for people in the three counties. Uh, in, the, in those three years, we have built about uh, tw in 29 communities. Uh, we have, in Santa Barbara, we have uh, communities in uh, Guadalupe, Santa Maria, Orquette, and also uh, Los Alamos, Lompac, Isla Vista, uh, Goleta, Santa Barbara, and Carpinteria. Our, our last development here in Santa Barbara is a Jardín de las Rosas, which you've probably seen is a couple of blocks away from here. Um, but right now we're building um, a development in um, Santa Maria, which is a senior development, and another one in Guadalupe that is uh, in, under construction, and that's for farm working housing. And uh, like I said before, um, we've, uh, in this last uh, 50 years, we've built about 1,200 affordable uh, single-family housing units. And that's where our name comes from, People Self Housing. That's how we started. But uh, so far, we've also built 1,900 affordable rental units, which is uh, 52 complexes. And that was, that's a probably serving about 5,000 uh, families or individuals. Uh, and uh, I, like I said before, we have uh, about 817 units in, this, in the county of Santa Barbara, which is uh, in about 17 complexes. Uh, but, you know, it's not just about providing the housing because uh, we're trying to create healthy communities and just providing housing does not achieve that goal. So we make sure that we provide on-site supported services in all our housing developments. And that includes uh, providing supported housing programs. Uh, that includes resident leadership, health screening, case management. Uh, we also provide community building and engagement uh, for our residents and educational programs. Uh, but the, the two facts that I like to usually make sure that people hear from us is that 99.9% .9 of our uh, young residents graduate from high school and we experience zero teen pregnancies. So I'm very, very proud of the work that we do because again, it's not just about providing a roof over people's head, but providing the services for them to succeed. I, one statistic that I heard is that it takes about 20 years for people to get out of poverty, and that means nothing going wrong within those 20 years, like a, you know, a death in the family or something like that. So providing those services is crucial. Um, in terms of uh, creative housing ideas that we have right now that we're implementing, uh, you know, we'd like to provide as much uh, multifamily uh, density, high density as we can, but if we can't, then uh, we go ahead and acquire RV parks or mobile home parks to make sure that we preserve that housing. It's so crucial right now. So that's it for now. Thank you. Next, we have um, Helene Schneider. 
and she's now with the regional, she's now the regional coordinator with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to express my gratitude to the League and how less stressful it is to be at a packed forum that you're putting on under tight timelines and not run for office. So um, <laughs> really appreciate that and appreciate all you do. Uh, and what a great crowd. Uh, it's great to be here. So how many of you have heard of what USICH is? Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Um, USICH, and it's the US Interagency Council on Homelessness. It actually was um, put into statute by Congress in 1987. So it's been around for quite a while. And it is a standalone federal interagency that basically connects the dots between the 19 different federal departments that work on the issue of homelessness. So HUD, HHS, the VA, ones you might think of, uh, certainly are involved in it, but also the post office, Social Security, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Justice, so all 19 of them. Uh, the agency, we're very small, we're under 20 people when we're fully staffed. Most of them are in DC as policy, uh, as a policy team connecting with the uh, different departments and people up on the hill. And then I'm one of five regional coordinators as part of the national initiatives team that uh, connects what's going on on a federal level to local communities, but really what I think is important, connecting what's happening in local communities back up to, what, to DC to help them shape what research into reality and put that reality piece into it. So I've been doing this since um, I left uh, office at City Hall, so it was late January 2018, so I've been there for uh, a number of, um, but a little over a year and a half. And last summer, USICH put out its updated federal strategic plan to end homelessness uh, called Home Together, and, and there may be still some uh, flyers in the back that give some information about it. But basically, it's the idea to look at how to prevent homelessness when possible, but if, if homelessness does occur, that you make it a rare, brief, and one-time experience. And what the federal strategic plan looks at is what does that mean? What does it mean for homelessness to be rare? What are ways to make it one time? What are ways to make it brief? And how to sustain that over time? So um, I'd like to also say my job is a connector of dots, but also a slayer of bureaucratic demons. We try to break down the barriers where possible um, when all these different agencies need to work together, and not just the federal government, and that's the home together part of it. It's obviously ending homelessness is creating a home, but also it's together. It's not just one layer of government. It's faith-based groups, businesses, community members, social service agencies at all level, and how to interact act in that way, how to break down those silos. So I want to bring up, um, on, our, on the website is a wealth of information. There's an e-newsletter that comes out twice a month, lots of information about uh, housing first models, good examples from around the country. So I picked one that's coming up um, that's being tested with the VA that I thought I'd share with you. Not in Santa Barbara just yet, but I think um, the information and data that will come from it will be really exciting. And it's through their SSVF program, which is the um, Supportive Services for Veterans and Families. And they're putting together what they call a shallow subsidies program starting in October. Um, there's $50 million uh, over the next two years being committed, of which 30 of that will be in the major cities in California. And what it does, basically, it's that bridge between an, um, basic some, some temporary rapid rehousing funds and long-term permanent supportive housing for veterans. It's, it's two years of putting together a shallow subsidy, so it, it's paying for 35% of the area market rental for some for a veteran, and that and that amount doesn't change over the two years, even if the people in the family's income rises or falls. It's pretty static, and, and you know doesn't go up or down based on their um, rentals, um, based on their income. But also then focusing around social services and other needs that the VA does provide. So they're going to do a lot of data around that. They had to change a lot of rules. You can just imagine what it's like to change a federal rule dealing with um, the veteran administration. But this is something rolling out in October. October. And my time's up. Next, we have Eddie Taylor, CEO of the United Way of Northern Santa Barbara County. I think I'm going to start off by competing with Helene. Uh, how many of you know what United Way is? Uh, I win. Okay. Um, United Way of Northern Santa Barbara County is the lead organization for uh, Home for Good, Santa Barbara County. Uh, it's important for me to point out that Home for Good was launched off of a solid foundation that was created 
by C3H, which many of you are familiar with. So I always like to say thanks to our friend Chuck Flax for stepping in when something needed to be done to put a foundation that we could work from. Um, there are um, three phases of Home for Good. The first is data, because our role is to address chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness as the primary target for our purpose being involved in homelessness. We have to have data. The second is, of course, um, helping people be ready for housing through documentation, and that's a lot of work that is done by our AmeriCorps team that works throughout the county. Um, and th the third is, is actually providing housing. And how do you do that? We're in Santa Barbara County. It's a tough deal, right? So we have four legs that uh, we put under this stool. They are the Funders Collaborative, the Business Leaders Task Force to build the political and public will that's needed to accomplish our goals, and they're a faith initiative. And what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is the Social Impact Fund. Um, again, I think I can beat Helene here. Most people in the room probably know what value investing is. <laughs> value investing is what we all hope that our money ma managers are doing for us, right? We buy low, we invest, we are able to sell high. So we know what value investing is. Most people probably don't understand what social value investing is. But if you've ever heard of um, Central Park, Central Park is uh, an outcome of social value investing and probably the best known in our country. When you combine the two, those two um, thought processes and efforts, what you have is a social impact investing model that's being utilized around the country a lot more. Recently, some people call it pay for success. So what is it? It's an opportunity to expand housing availability while providing a return on investment that attracts capital from folks who would otherwise not get involved in addressing homelessness. Why is it important? I think the reasons are very obvious um, to us. We know from the data that there are over 400 chronically homeless individuals living in Santa Barbara County. Currently, there is very little funding for supportive housing, and there's even less money for supportive services, which are needed to keep people with disabilities stable once they're housed. Why does it work? It works because the interventions that are provided to help people get stable once they're housed cut the costs to society, to our community, uh, really substantially. Um, the cycle, other, the alternative is the street, police, jail, court, hospitals, police, street, shelters, and on and on. So what we've learned from other um, regions in the country is that housing first is a model that can stop that cycle. How does it work? John is benefiting directly from uh, a social impact investment strategy. The Cox Bungalow units was uh, actually created by a few small investors who leveraged $350,000 to lock up that piece of property, get it through the entitlement process. Those investors earned was a very nice return on their investment, somewhere between 12 and 20% was their return, which they'll get paid out as soon as the permanent funding comes into place. But what happened with that $350,000 is now a $8.7 million. $8 million property that will house 29 chronically homeless individuals. That's how it works and why it works. Um, and the, the rest of the math gets pretty fuzzy, but you can imagine that there's about $20 million in savings available when we approach this issue with uh, social impact investing. Thank you. Now we have Lucas Zucker, Policy and Communications Director from the Central Coast Alliance United for Sustainable Economy, also known to many of us as CAUSE. Hi, uh, my name is Lucas and I'm here to talk about power. So I'm the Policy Director at CAUSE, which is a social justice organization in uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. And we really see the root of the housing crisis as the widening imbalance of power uh, between tenants and landlords um, uh, because people are essentially willing to pay almost anything to not be homeless. 
um, and, and particularly in, a, in kind of a shrinking number of places that have strong economies and, and quality jobs. Uh, and we also are seeing a, an increasing concentration of land ownership among fewer and fewer hands as there's kind of more corporate and, and you know, large financial sector presence in the housing market. Um, and that's leading to a speculation of, of, of rents and housing costs. And so uh, what we do is we organize tenants because uh, tenants are individually pretty weak in their relationship with their landlord. Um, but uh, together, collectively, tenants are, are actually pretty strong as a group. Um, and we really focus on folks who are kind of at, you would say, the tip of the spear uh, of the housing crisis, uh, working class families, immigrant families. Um, and indeed, what we've seen in the city of Santa Barbara is in the, the last few years, uh, since its peak in 2011, a 24% decrease in Latino population of the city of Santa Barbara um, as a result of that displacement. Um, and so we think to prevent displacement, the most important thing is to, uh, to protect people, to keep people in their homes um, in that moment of crisis, um, the moment of crisis where people are receiving an eviction notice, uh, a sudden rent increase um, that they're not prepared for, hadn't been saving for, weren't ready to, to move. Um, and that's how folks end up on the street. That's how folks end up moving out of Santa Barbara and ultimately maybe out of the state. Um, and so we, uh, and, and I think that's particularly becomes this crisis for folks who are facing barriers, whether that's, um, you know, people with disabilities, uh, you know, families that have small kids, uh, you know, people because of their uh, language access or immigration status um, who might be less able to find a new place to live. Um, and so we've worked to pass policies, um, one of them being the, the one that my friend from Legal Aid uh, mentioned, the uh, one-year lease law, um, which has kind of an opt-out, but, but guarantees uh, a landlord to offer a one-year lease, which really just provides some stability for year to year, right? Um, at the end of that year, rent can increase or, you know, an eviction can happen, but um, a family can know at least till the end of this year, I'm good, I'm safe, my kids are going to be able to stay in their school district, I'll be able to stay in my neighborhood in my home. Um, we were able to do that with, with kind of agreement from, um, from kind of the property owner associations. Um, what we worked on with not so much agreement uh, was a just cause ordinance for the city of Santa Barbara, um, which is an ordinance that says that you can't evict people for no reason. Um, that if you want to evict a tenant, uh, you have to have a legitimate cause, like uh, you know they're damaging the building, they're causing a nuisance for other tenants, uh, you know they're not paying their rent, right? At, at using the unit for legal purposes, uh, but essentially you you can't kick someone out of their home for you know uh, and and you know put them out without any kind of fair reason for it. Um, the uh, so that that will hopefully be uh, coming into effect soon. Um, the, the last thing is uh, AB 1482, which is a, a state bill that we, we work to support um, through, through some of our, our statewide partnerships with other tenants' rights organizations across California. Um, and it's really the largest advance in uh, tenants' rights that's happened in California in decades. Um, and so AB 1482 uh, caps uh, rent increase. It's a it's rent gouging measure. I wouldn't really call it rent control um, because it doesn't cap it at below what the market is going up already. Um, but essentially, you know, says you can't just buy up a building and, and double double rents overnight, right? Um, it's capped at five percent plus the annual rate of inflation, which ends up being about seven or eight percent a year um, of what you can kind of raise it per year. Um, and as well, it actually takes that just cause eviction protection and actually expands it statewide. Um, so we're uh, we're excited about these things. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of this uh, for for us is really about that that elephant in the room of that you know imbalance of power. And um, so we work to you know build power among tenants to advocate for the policies that they need um, and really determine their own destinies. Great, thank you. Now there are a couple of creative housing solutions that I want to address that didn't quite come up naturally, so I'm going to put a couple of you on the spot and maybe just give them two minutes to, um, to respond. I'll start with um, Rob Fredericks. And one thing that I think is important, and we know that our county is looking at and our city is looking at public lands that can be used to develop housing, and um, faith communities also have sometimes donated land, and you know the, the cost of land can be a really significant cost. So I know that your agency has sometimes benefited from that, and maybe you can just address that quickly. Absolutely, I'll, I'll address a couple items. So um, we do have to look at ways of reducing the cost of 
development. The total cost of development is just skyrocketed and gone out of sight. I mean, it'll make your eyes water if I told you what the cost per unit is on that Gardens on Hope development. But um, to combat that, we need to look at ways that we can reduce costs. If we can take the land cost out of the equation, we can make a project work. And there are opportunities to take land cost out of the equation. And in the city, there are city-owned land that's that's a possibility to access now. After last night's city council meeting, I don't want to delve too far into uh, parking lot uh, um, opportunities, but we have been looking at that. And it is, you know, you, you look at, you drive by and you look at these underutilized surface parking lots, and you go, oh my goodness, what could we do with that, with the airspace above that surface parking lot and provide some affordable housing there? That's an opportunity. That's something that we're looking at with the city. We had a city uh, hearing at the city council meeting on it, and we're, we're delving into that currently. Uh, and a, a good example of working with a faith-based community is our Grace Village um, development uh, next to the Mark up on Upper State Street by La Cumbre Plaza. It's uh, 58 senior uh, units that we built, and we were able to get that built through the donation from the Grace Lutheran uh, Church congregation gave us the land. They said, here's the land, but... We want affordable senior housing built on it. So um, as, as our uh, former mayor, uh, Helene Schneider, said uh, to me once that um, the separation of church and state should be a screen door and not a block wall, and that's one where the screen door really works. So those are two good examples. Thank, Thank you. you. And then one more. Um, everybody's wondering on who I'm going to call next, but Tessa, maybe you can speak a little bit to I know PATH and LA was involved in some of the measures that helped raise funds at the local level. And if you can just speak briefly about that. Absolutely. Um, so I think one of the ways, and, and some of uh, my peers up here have discussed kind of funding these incredibly, now, now even more and more expensive permanent supportive housing um, units and developments. Um, and one of the things, and I'm sure many, many, if not most of you in this room are familiar with, um, in Los Angeles County, a couple of um, different measures, one at the city level and one at the county level, were passed um, in the past three to four years. Um, one was called Measure H, and that was at the county level, and that's for supportive services um, to the tune of billions of dollars in supportive services for, um, for homeless individuals, whether it be um, in transitional housing situations or in permanent housing. Um, and then Proposition HHH at the city level in Los Angeles um, was a bond measure um, that was attached to um, property taxes um, and is generating millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars um, for the development of supportive housing. So as we've seen, and, and some of these folks have talked about, um, the, the kind of trends in permanent supportive housing with the, with the dissolution of redevelopment agencies and um, the tax credit allocation committee being such a, such a competitive process now, um, these different creative solutions around community-based initiatives um, to raise additional funds specifically allocated for the development of supportive housing and homeless services in general is really critical, especially as we have limited funds as a community, as a city and a county, um, to contribute to those processes. So creating new revenue streams dedicated to these solutions um, has become imperative. What creative housing solution would you like to see that would have impact? And this can be one that your own organization is doing or that um, you would like to maybe even see a different organization do. So it came up a couple of times already, but I don't think I can emphasize it enough that um, at the beginning, Emily's slide said that 739 of our homeless neighbors have already been assessed, prioritized for permanent supportive housing. And you heard a lot about how we're going to get roofs over their heads. But what we don't have right now in Santa Barbara County is funding and a mechanism to give the intensive supportive services that it will take to transition them into a home. And so we talked about that their services are being offered at a lot of locations, but the type of intensive supportive services that would take to transition someone who um, has a, a substance abuse disorder and a severe and persistent mental illness and potentially a chronic health condition, it's a tall order. Um, Caseloads for the housing first model that was mentioned, one in 18 
And so we just have not yet developed the resources to have that, um, that type of intervention where someone's, when they transition, are being seen daily, that those services are all being offered in the home. And so there is a mechanism that others have used, and it's billing Medi-Cal for those services. For those that meet medical necessity, um, clinical health care providers can set up a mechanism with a, um, your managed health care plan in order to, um, to actually, you need startup funds, you need funds that cover what Medi-Cal doesn't cover, so that's what we need to raise as a community. But then within one year of that person being housed, about 80% of their supportive services are being paid by Medi-Cal. That's a, bur we can get there, right? There's a path, um, but it will take creative, it'll take our service providers who can get linked with that Medi-Cal billing system and um, figure out how to, to really develop this model locally. I was fortunate to work for Step Up on Second before coming to the county and launch a program in the Inland Empire where we were billing Medi-Cal for these services and we housed 123 chronically homeless individuals um, in the first year. And so um, we can do it here and we just need to get the right minds at the table um, to, we want the roof over the head, but we need those intensive support services for those we need to house and those that are ready housed that we aren't offering those supportive service, those intensive, uh, that very high intensity intensive supportive services in the home. Yeah. Um, I'll definitely echo support for um, any housing first uh, approach. Um, I also didn't hear too much mention of um, community land trusts as an option, nonprofit owned community land trusts for permanent affordability. It can be a, a great tool. Um, I'm obviously gonna talk about co-ops. Um, I would love to see more cooperative housing stock in Santa Barbara. It just, it, there's, there's not enough of it and the barriers to creating more of it include funding but also public education, uh, support for active ac advocacy efforts um, like the work that Future Housing Communities is going to be doing creating incubators for cooperative communities. It takes about one to three years to really create a, a stable long-term community. So um, cultivating local experts that can help those communities um, be birthed and, and, uh, and sustain would be excellent. Um, on the student front, uh, as UCSB expands and creates more housing, um, if the Ocean Road project uh, gets underway, it would be great to see some of that turned into affordable student housing rather than out-of-town landlord-owned housing. Um, uh, I'll echo what Lucas said about supporting uh, residents uh, in their uh, relationships to their landlords, support for the Isla Vista Tenants Union. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a Santa Barbara equivalent, but there probably is. Uh, but support for renters uh, in dealing with their landlords. Um, I also know there's a conversation about creating some kind of tax on cannabis sales in Santa Barbara County and using it to support things like services for students and affordable housing. Um, yeah, if we could just do all that, that would be great. <laughs> Easy, right? So, <laughs> um, so I g gave you a couple of innovative solutions, but uh, one uh, idea that I really liked that was presented years ago. It was uh, Frank Thompson's in the room who's developed a lot of affordable housing in our community and one idea that he had with uh, working with Families Act is um, a, a development that has different levels of of housing and services for for the acute different acuity levels of of the people living there so that uh if if they have need a higher level of care they don't have to go off site they can be provided right on site and have the whole person wraparound services there for them no matter what their situation is i really think we need to to dust that off and and get that going somewhere in the county uh, we built El Carrillo uh, that serves the homeless uh, back in 2006, and it's 62 units on a half acre. So it's 122 units to the acre, right? Pretty dense, but it's a great development. It serves, the, it serves people moving from homelessness, but it's not a true housing first model. We need, we need to do some, we need to go big or go home. We need to do something much bigger than El Carrillo maybe two, two and a half times the size of it at a site that's appropriately sited and located with 
the services that are needed for the property. That's one thing that we're finding is a real rub with, we're providing the housing, but the service level really needs to step up and we need to work together better with housing providers and service providers uh, so that we're not setting up our residents to fail, we're, we're setting them up to succeed. So uh, that's what I wanna see, thanks. Santa Barbara is the perfect place to tackle a housing crisis. Our county is one of the most unaffordable in the country, but we're also small enough to know the decision makers, and they seem to share a sense of urgency and are willing to listen to big ideas. We have a lot of strengths, including good local designers and planners and a world-class housing authority. We can lead the country in a green energy makeover while developing community types that are attractive, responsive to the prospective resident input, and permanently affordable. We need to be ready to respond to the major changes that will occur over the next 10 to 20 years. For example, it's the Stanford economist Tony Seba believes that 95% of all passenger miles will be in autonomous electric vehicles by 2030. So there will be no rational economic sense to own a car. Step one, this year is changing mindsets. We need to educate homeowners and empower renters. Over time, we hope to remove the stigma associated with renter and low income. We need to hold UCSB and City College accountable for providing the housing needed for their increases in enrollments. I used to consider them a big strength in, in the community, but for housing, they are a big part of the problem. We should encourage local corporations to provide permanently affordable housing for their employees. That could start with the school district's Tatum property that's ready for development. Let's please not just develop into senior housing because it's the easiest way to make a profit. Back to legal aid. So, um, here's a, sh a sh it could be a very long wish list <laughs> of things that um, this organization uh, would like. Um, one thing is the expansion of a present program. It's called the Sergeant Shriver Program. It, we get state funding uh, for our North California offices to provide what you would call a civil law public defender, also known as a civil um, Gideon versus Wainwright type of public defender, uh, a, a, a lawyer. So it's, it's like the public defender for criminal law, but, but it's translated into civil law. So the, the rationale is if someone would be charged with a misdemeanor for trespassing um, and, would be, and if they're indigent or low income, they would get a free lawyer, why shouldn't someone who's losing their home, who just happens to be low income, why shouldn't they have a lawyer? It's a, it's a, a, a devastating um, uh, life event to, to not only lose one home, but the, the, what, what precedes that. Um, it's uh, to get the notice, to have to go to court, to have to deal with lawyers, to you know, deal with the disaster that, that made you low income and lo lose the house possibly. So the other thing um, would be uh, funding for social workers. I've been there 17 years, and from day one, I've been saying, where are our social workers at Legal Aid? Because we're directly dealing with people that are facing homelessness, and we're trying to keep them housed. That's our solution. Wherever you're at, let's keep you there. Um, and we don't have to deal with building houses and supporting people as much as let's keep them home. Everybody who's homeless used to have a home. Um, emergency funds for renters that are low income and um, can't afford their rent. That would be a pool of money that could be distributed to people that through um, some sort of uh, financial disaster uh, would get a small amount of money in order to um, make up a, a, a disaster uh, or compensate for a disaster that would otherwise happen. Sometimes landlords are evicting people over just a few dollars. And so um, it's, that's important. Finally, with this new ordinance, 5885, um, I see a need that we're gonna need to expand the, the, the rental housing mediation task force that's sponsored by the city of Santa Barbara. If every, if every tenant who's being 
evicted is being um, uh, supposed to be going to mediation even before a, a court hearing or before court filing, then that, that agency needs to be expanded. And right now it's long-term employee, uh, Andrea Buffano. I don't even think she has an assistant anymore, a permanent assistant. So um, it, it's, it's a program worth expanding. I'll just echo everyone's sentiments on this panel around permanent supportive housing. It may seem, seem trivial, but permanent supportive housing, plain and simple, works. But I think the purpose of this discussion and having all of you, you know, join us tonight and thank you for being here is that we have to rethink about what what we what we consider permanent supportive housing. We have to rethink about what that looks like. The traditional models are wonderful, but they're expensive. They take a long time to build, and they work. But I think supportive housing can look different, right? I think we can we can three D print a, a home and put in, and associate that with case management, and that's going to be effective supportive housing. But that support system has to be in place. The support piece is what makes permanent supportive housing 90% effective, 90% retention rate. Um, it's what makes it less costly than someone living on the street. So that support piece is critical. So I think kind of, I've boiled it down to three three kind of C's of what we're gonna have to do to get creative and to have um, really um, effective housing solutions in this community. And that's commitment, commitment to this issue, commitment to addressing it as a community, um, collaboration across all the different sectors, right? This panel up here and all of you in the room represent um, a ton of different worlds and networks and connections that we're all gonna have to tap into to really address this issue in an effective and an efficient way. Um, and um, then, Capital. I mean, you've heard it from a lot of these folks, right? Creating new revenue streams, investing in the social workers, in the nurses, in the mental health um, folks, and investing in um, in really the people that we're serving. Um, investing in caring and providing comprehensive care in these um, housing facilities to the people that we're serving, and that that's what's going to make them stay and and really truly end homelessness. I see uh, two main areas uh, where there's a lot of innovative ideas. The first is our existing housing stock is our biggest resource. So we should be looking at creative ways to help people access it and to stabilize the cost of that housing stock. Uh, some ideas, uh, expanding on what others have said, is perhaps we could have a renter's loan fund that does micro loans. Just getting into a unit costs thousands of dollars. Um, I think that would help a lot of people. Um, we need an apartment acquisition program to acquire small and mid-sized apartment complexes, either through investors or uh, raising more capital from foundations and government, and stabilize the rents by putting it into nonprofit ownership or the land trust. Um, the other. The other idea would be um, doing what we can to increase housing supply and reduce the production time and cost. And one thing we can do, it, I think has a huge potential, is to facilitate accessory dwelling units. That has more potential than anything to create a large number of units over time. Why not have you know, pre-approved plans where a homeowner can come in and buy a, across the counter permit, get a unit that they can put up quickly. Why not have a finance program for that? Um, the other thing is to finally get serious about streamlining our environmental review and development review process. It's ludicrous that it takes four, five, six, sometimes a decade to get projects approved. It's shameful and our community can do better. Okay, um, both of your housing authorities have focused on trying to house the most vulnerable uh, people within the community. Um, our formerly homeless neighbors, who are now uh, living in units that the housing authorities have developed over the past few years. But keeping them housed, retaining housing, has become a really significant issue. So I'll start with trying to keep the folks who are the most vulnerable 
who now are formally homeless, and working with our partners that we have here in, in Santa Barbara County in advocating for additional funding to make sure that the wraparound services, these intensive support services, are available at the site, uh, which is really important for them to be available at the site. One of the other things that, that we did at uh, Pescator Lofts, 33 units serving formerly homeless in Isla Vista, we did adopt a room program, and that was for the first time. That got the community, the faith community, the neighborhood, directly involved in supporting these individuals who are soon to be formerly homeless by providing funds that allowed us to provide furnishings, a level of furnishings and household goods to the folks who are coming in with just what they could carry. Uh, we talked about the factory built homes to try to reduce the cost. Uh, right now, the um, county has been a really great partner in looking for county owned properties that would make sense for affordable housing. Same thing with the cities. Uh, many of you probably saw the MTD um, competition. We're working with MTD on their site to provide some additional affordable and market rate uh, and workforce uh, rental housing there. Uh, working with three churches, two on the south coast, one in the north with additional property, and then with the school district, uh, which will help to reduce the, the cost of those lands. But again, getting back to my former ad, additional resources, Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, the VASH program, uh, the Home Investment Partnership Act, CDBG, and tax credits. Thank you. Before I go on to talking about creative housing solutions, I want to urge you to contact the governor. Uh, it is very easy and uh, to become creative once we have money. Uh, so legislators in uh, Sacramento passed SB5 last week. So please contact the governor and make sure that he signs that bill. It will create a, a billion dollars, uh, with a B, a billion dollars for housing, for affordable housing, uh, that will be a permanent source of funding. So please uh, make sure you contact the governor. Uh, having said that, uh, I think one of those uh, creative solutions is to, uh, to, require, to have a zero parking requirement for housing because uh, we have a housing crisis and we've got to house people and not cars. So uh, us developers, whether we're market rate developers or affordable housing developers, we know when to provide uh, parking. Uh, some places will need to provide it. If, uh, if the housing is in, a, uh, in an area where there's a lot of transit, we don't need any parking and we, we prefer to, you know, again, provide housing and not uh, parking uh, for, for cars. Uh, the second option uh, is, uh, is, is not so creative, but uh, is, is a more realistic uh, solution to a creative uh, policy, which is the inclusionary housing. Uh, when you have inclusionary housing, you sometimes give uh, developers the opportunity to have an in-lieu fee, which I like to call actually the exclusionary fee of inclusionary housing, because that, what that allows developers is to exclude uh, affordable housing from their developments. And it's not just that, but sometimes that fee becomes so low that there's, there's no incentive for market rate developers to provide housing. Uh, I don't want to provide any, uh, any names, but there are some municipalities that have uh, an, uh, an in-lieu fee of $4,200, when it costs us about $450,000 to provide an affordable unit. So that's about a 1%. Um, the other uh, solution is that we need to take away that power to say no to housing to neighbors and provide that power to the state of, uh, up in Sacramento because most neighbors do not like housing, and when they say no to housing, they're actually saying no to people being housed. So the state up in Sacramento can do a better job at saying yes.
So uh, I mentioned I was regional coordinator for USICH. My region's California and Arizona, so I've been um, going around and seeing a lot of what's out there. So I'll mention a few that come to mind in terms of some innovative practices. One in the city of Riverside, sort of taking what Grace Village has done but maximizing it. Uh, the, the city of Riverside had an interfaith um, summit and created the Love Your Neighbor Initiative where every single faith-based group um, is looking to see what they can do, whether it be putting housing in their parking lots or adopting a family or not a, uh, literally adopting, but you know what I mean. Um, but you know, doing something, a lot of it related to housing with the land that they have, not necessarily um, and while still having their place of worship, but looking at excess properties. That's one. Uh, city of Long Beach has an app that they use within the city to coordinate when it comes to uh, encampment areas with not only law enforcement and your parks and public works, but also public health and the social service agencies, and it geolocates things that help then the city connect people into the services, so it's not just moving people around, but actually solving the problem and um, creating those... those um, connections there. Sacramento was one of a place called a 100-day challenge for youth. A uh, number of places around the country through Away Home America has been doing this. Sacramento uh, had 100 days to house 100 youth, and, and the, the key is to engage youth involved themselves in the solutions. And they um, were able to house, I think, over 200. But I'll just end with saying, no matter what any of this is doing, there's really four components, I think, to make things work. One is political will, not just among your elected officials, but everyone who is involved in the issue to use the influence you have to make something to happen. The second is good coordination of the resources that you do have, making sure you don't leave money on the table of the resources that are there and that you maximize and leverage the funding you do have. Three is good collaborative efforts. Let everyone do what they do best and back off and let them do their job, but then you step in when you need to do the role that you do. And then finally, a never give up attitude. As we know from here, sometimes it takes 10, 20, 30 times to interact with someone before they're finally ready to get the help, and then that help is there when they need it. I'm going to focus on two ideas already mentioned here that I think need to be combined. Uh, yeah. One is a housing bond because more than anything, we need a local stream of revenue for affordable housing, period. Um, and the second is the idea Jennifer mentioned of, of an apartment acquisition fund. Uh, and I say that because the reality is the majority of low-income people do not live in capital A affordable housing. The majority of low-income people live in low-cost private housing, um, that's low-cost because it was maybe in a community that's been stigmatized. It's maybe been kind of run down over time, right? Um, and that housing is on this speculative market where literally at any moment it can be bought up uh, and, you know, jacked up rents, you know, new paint put on it, and that affordable housing is gone. And we're losing that private, kind of you may call it naturally occurring affordable housing much faster than we're able to build, uh, you know, public public affordable housing. Um, and so we're, it, it feels like we're kind of running on a treadmill sometimes, right? Um, and, and so the, the thing that we need to do is buy up that apartment and take it off, buy up that apartment, take it off the speculative market before it's bought up and flipped. Uh, and you can buy it up and then rehab it, maybe make energy efficiency improvements, et cetera. Um, but this is able to move that slumlord housing um, into something permanently affordable like our local housing authority or people self up housing, um, and which helps stabilize the whole neighborhood rather than this kind of swing from you know, substandard housing to you know, sudden gentrification, you have kind of stability, right? And stable investment in that, that housing stock and in the whole neighborhood, um, and is really able to get much more bang for the buck, right? You're, you're able to preserve a naturally occurring affordable housing for much cheaper per unit um, and do it much faster because it often just needs some fixing up instead of you know, full construction from the beginning. Um, and often it's easier to kind of get over some of that NIMBY opposition that folks have talked about here, right? The, the not in my backyard to building, building new affordable housing. Um, and so I'll just, uh, yeah, and the, th this has been, been done recently uh, in, in Ventura. Uh, there was uh, a building that was owned by Dario Pini, who you know, we know and lost a lot of, uh, of housing here. Uh, city hit it with a bunch of uh, you know, code violations. Um, then the housing authority actually bought it, converted it to affordable housing. It's now permanently affordable, and all the tenants were able to stay. Uh, and so I think the best thing a city can do, invest in, is our own housing stock. I'm not going after that. <laughs> <laughs> 
So my notes say that social impact investment funds leverage government funding, attract new investors to the effort, and leverage Medi-Cal to provide services to people with disabilities once they're housed. Innovative ways to house people. I'm just going to bounce the ball back down the table. Why don't we just really think innovative? Why don't we really talk about how we create um, housing using a printer on lots that are provided by the county because they've got excess land, including parking lots, so that we can leverage the money from the investment strategies to make up the difference that Medi-Cal is not going to cover because our focus is on providing services to the chronically homeless, and even when we have 86% of the costs covered, you're still talking about a $2 million bill every year for the 400 or so people that we have to house and provide services to so that they stop dying in the street. So if you want to get creative, let's bounce the ball around this table. There's a whole lot of great ideas here. Parking lots are great. Thank you. follow up on, on what Lucas was saying and others about apartment acquisition fund, that's a great idea. Both housing authorities have uh, special tools available to work with local landlords to purchase uh, properties. We can do tax exempt notes with seller carrybacks for landlords that they want to sell to us other than to out of town investors that would raise the rents. We've done that successfully. There's also a bill by uh, Representative Adam Schiff to uh, make it easier to have landlords do a 1033 exchange uh, if they work with housing authorities. And I want to work with Representative Schiff to enhance that bill to actually uh, forgive capital gains if they sell to housing authorities. I think there's an appetite for that because with such a huge housing crisis that we're facing. So, yeah. So this is really, this. thank you, Rob. And this is, very interesting, you know, the housing, house, supportive housing, housing first is something that a lot of us have been talking about for quite a while, and I really do feel like it's gaining momentum um, here in our community, which is exciting to see. The home share model also, I like to tell people that in Ventura, in um, San Luis Obispo, I'm sure many other communities, but those touch us, they've had successful home share programs for quite a while. So these are these are things, whether it's home share, it's certainly something we can do in our community. The housing first and supportive housing models are um, in effect, not only in our country, but all over the world being done successfully. So now we're gonna do questions and answer, and I'll take audience questions, and I might still have a few of my own too, but um, who has the mic? Volunteer, and we're going to give you the mic. Try to be concise with your questions so that a few people get a chance to ask. My name is Jacqueline Bianchi, and I loved everything I heard today with all the solutions, and I think it's great. But I have one concern, and that is about the tenants. Um, there are people who have changed their lives but have bad past, bad credit, maybe bad background che checks. How are these people supposed to qualify for these? services, um, should there be possibly something devoted to that, to helping them, you know, uh, become more eligible for housing? One thing I will say, you know, the state regulations around what is housing first are very specific, and we've been doing training on, you know, compliance, and one thing that they require is that the housing be very low barrier and not screen people out for things like bad credit, you know, not for criminal history except for some exceptions. So the Housing First model does look at that, but do other folks have things they'd like to add about, though, kind of helping people, you know, with credit scores and other issues? Okay. Uh, thank you. And, and again, the housing authorities um, have really been working as we've been um, committed to serving the most vulnerable. We know the most vulnerable also have perhaps a, a checkered credit history and, and, um, and, and past references. So we start working with our support service partners. This is actually where the support service partners come into play even before the key is given to the individual. And that is to help clean up what they can. Uh, we've worked with legal aid, we've worked with a number of different support service partners to try to clean up what they can. 
And then as housing authorities, we do have some ability, and again, as Emily mentioned, with the exception of, of some um, certain types of offenses that you could probably guess, um, to work with individuals and give them the opportunity to, to be housed. So the, it is with the um, affordable housing, the capital A affordable housing, it's easier than it, than it used to be because both housing authorities recognize when we made that commitment, we knew there would be folks, um, the folks that are coming to us are not going to have clean credit and, and everything that comes with it. We're even working with some of the cities with um, what is called tenant-based rental assistance through the home program to provide security deposits that we cannot provide through the Section 8. Uh, we have 9,000 unduplicated names of individuals throughout the county uh, that need housing. I know the City Housing Authority has an equally long list. So we're trying to, to get people housed, and the removal of the barriers uh, to housing are very important. Where would you recommend a person to go first? Maybe they've left this far behind in their past, but it still is in their past. Where would we go to, you said support housing? Well, I, I think if they're connected to a support service partner, um, okay. it, it would be, you know, um, and, and that would be the place to start, to let their the case manager, the person working with them know, I really need to clean up some things, and then get on the Housing Authority waiting list. Um, whichever areas of the county you're willing to live in, we have um, property-specific lists as well as countywide and citywide lists. Okay, can we take one more question, please? Thank you. Hello, I work in the affordable housing sector. I'm Sharon Rose and I work on the Mobile Homeowners Project. Um, something I used to do in my lifetime was be a program manager in public health. I was part of the California Tobacco Control Program and we made California smoke free in 10 years. Now, what I never hear, it, I appreciated very much, Helene, your concise list of the things policy wise and so forth that need to happen. But something I think we forget is the public education component. And the kind of people who come to these meetings are people who are already on our side, usually, generally speaking. But I, th I was with a group of women today in Goleta, and it's just kind of sitting here resonating with me because they were sitting there talking about the terrible homeless problem and how it's affecting their husband's businesses when they walk out the door of their offices. And here's this homeless person, and it's bad for business, yada, yada, yada. And I just keep thinking how we, we really must find a way to do a deeper public education program to make other people understand the need for supportive services. Because I think everybody here gets it. So that's just one thing I wanted to share. The other thing was, do we have a real estate component to identify buildings when they come open? And that was another thing I saw in Goleta, this big motorcycle place came open and they moved out. And here was this huge property with a huge parking lot over there by Fairview and Hollister. You could put a lot of small units on there, but it's, it's zoning, it's creative thinking. But first of all, it's get a hold of that property that's already disturbed. Because people in the environmental community don't want all this new development. We want to redevelop what's already developed. And I th we don't need another restaurant in Santa Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. One more question. Thank you, Emily. Uh, this is Danny Anderson. I'm the executive director of the Independent Living Resource Center. And we provide services to individuals with all disabilities. We're the only cross-disability organization of our kind within the three counties. And I just want to thank Mr. Taylor for saying the phrase people with disabilities tonight. That is the phrase that um, represents the disability community. I heard a lot about vulnerable populations, seniors, veterans. Um, People with disabilities are the largest minority in our country and we're represented in all of those vulnerable populations. So when we're talking about housing and the importance of existing housing, I just feel like it's important that we mention that in helping people with disabilities, specifically physical disabilities like myself, to find housing, they find themselves taking the longest to find housing because it's not accessible. So when we're talking about new housing builds, I would advocate strongly to make sure that all of these units are as accessible as possible so that they're available for everyone who's experiencing homelessness and low income. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone on our panel want to 
say anything in response to that. I know it's been an issue. We have some of our affordable housing stock is not always accessible, but new housing stock, we want to see that developed as accessible. Yeah, I, I will say that both housing authorities with every development we build and, and people self-help housing, all the new developments are comply and they, we're very concerned to, to ensure that we are providing accessible units to people um, that all the units are accessible. The real issue, as, as Emily said, though, is there's a lot of older housing stock there that's not accessible to people, and we need to do what we can to help make those accessible. One quick question I want to ask our panel, because I don't want to leave. I, it would be remiss, I think, not to discuss it, something zoning and regulations. It's sort of been alluded to, but can people say a little bit about what, you know, as far as changes that could be made that would have an impact. Lucas, well, I think I'll let you go. I'm like eagerly, uh, <laughs> well I think speaking to uh, Mr. Campanella's point uh, around that kind of real like missing middle housing, right? Uh, you know, we talk about that there's the single family homes and then there's kind of big apartment buildings, but there's this huge need for that kind of duplex, triplex, that's really good for multi-generational living, serves all those other purposes, right? Um, but also tends to be the most affordable housing on the market. Um, because it's, you know, it's, it's wood frame, it's not, you know, big, big glass and steel kind of structure, but it's also not that, you know, huge McMansion. Um, and so we saw the city of Minneapolis and I think uh, state of Oregon also are moving to end single family zoning yep. and say we're going to, you know, anywhere in our city, because we have had this kind of pattern of often racially and economically exclusive, exclusive zoning, right, and picking particular neighborhoods that we're going to kind of preserve in amber as these single family only neighborhoods, but say, Anyone, no matter where you are in the city, you have to at least allow like duplexes and triplexes, right? You don't have to be Manhattan overnight, but we're going to say this is the bare minimum floor. Right. And I think to get these changes, to get these creative housing solutions, and it's been alluded to already, is it takes advocacy. It takes people, you know, first step I think often is understanding the issue. And, you know, we do homelessness 101 trainings. We have this handout in the back where you can see some homelessness 101 trainings we have coming up in October, November. But the idea that, you know, understanding the issue is the first step. And then the second step is really engaging with elected officials and policymakers and really advocating. I think that, you know, in Los Angeles, one thing I heard when they were successful in passing those measures, they did public polling in advance, and they heard from people that they wanted to see solutions. They wanted their elected officials to do something. And, you know, we sometimes, I think, assume that sometimes people at council meetings or board of supervisors who get up and say, not in my backyard, I don't want this supportive housing, we think that they represent the majority of people, but that really people want solutions. We, you know, the affordable housing crisis impacts all of us. So I think that finding out, learning more about how you can engage is really critical. So that's, you know, from my position with Home for Good, from my position with the League of Women Voters, there are a lot of ways that you can become an advocate and get involved. So please, you know, feel free to take one of these handouts, come talk to me, come talk to the fellow speakers on this panel. You know, we need you to be part of this solution. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you all for being here.